Say to God, come on, put those hands together. Let's praise him today. Yes, it's just something about Sunday morning. Well, that I can't on, wait. All Sunday morning, Sunday morning, to sing and shout, sing and shout. And praise the Lord. Well, Good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to worship God this morning, and we're so glad you're here with us. The call to worship this morning will be from Psalms 18, beginning in verse 1. And it reads, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Isn't that great? Let's pray. Father, you truly are our Savior. You truly are our champion. You truly are our stronghold. Father, you are worthy to be praised. We are so fortunate to have this opportunity. Father, we ask your blessing upon us as we worship you this morning. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Before your throne we humbly bow, giving you praise, our awesome God. Thanking you for all you've done, we love you, Lord, the Holy One. Before your throne we humbly bow, giving you praise, our awesome God. Thanking you for all you've done. We love you, Lord, the Holy One. Before your throne we humbly bow, giving you praise, our awesome God. Thanking you for all you've done. We love you, Lord, the Holy One. Hallelujah to you, Lord. We 
let's pray together this time. Heavenly Father, as we come to you at this hour and at this time, this day, we're just so thankful, Father, to have another opportunity to be in your presence, to be able to worship you, to be able to praise you and to lift up your name. Dear God, we're so thankful for this moment. We are thankful for this day. We realize, dear God, that our strength comes from you. Our protection comes from you. The guidance that we receive, it comes from you. Father, we're just so humbled. We're so grateful to be in your presence. When we examine who we are and we compare who we are to who you are, dear God, we are just humbled. You are so mighty. You are so powerful. You're so magnificent. Dear God, I know it's a cliche. It's oftentimes overused. But you're just awesome. You're just awesome in so many ways. That is why we adore you. We praise you. We give you the glory and the honor in all that we do. Once again, you've allowed us to come together to participate in another worship service. And Father, we have to be honest. These last few days, weeks, and months have been very difficult to focus it's been very difficult for us to remain faithful because there are so many distractions in our world today. So many evil things going on. Some of the protests are good and some of them are not. Some of the people protesting have their hearts in the right place and some do not. Father, help us to realize that Whatever we believe in or whatever we stand for, the only thing that matters at the end of the day is how we feel about you. We know how you feel about us because you created us, you placed us here, and you made us in your image and your likeness. But help us to realize, Father, that all of the problems that exist in our world today, in this city, in our communities and society, they can only be resolved if we give you your rightful place. Give us the wisdom. Give us the courage to lean on you and not to our own understanding. Father, just help us. Help us during these difficult times. Help us to realize, Father, that it really doesn't matter who is in the White House if we don't have you in our house. Help us to realize that we need you in our lives. Dear God, I want to take a few moments to just thank you for the men that show up here weekly to make sure that we have a service to present to your people on Sunday morning. Father, I thank you for Brother Lynn Fuller, and for his dedication and commitment to this church. I thank you for Brother Rodney Mosley, Father, for his commitment to making this worship recording possible. Thank you for Brother Bill Butler and for his dedication to what we're doing here. Dear God, it's so easy to take people for granted when you don't see them because they're behind the camera. But I thank you for these brothers. We also thank you for Brother Jimmy, who brings the lessons, and also for Brother Baron Jones, who brings the message. Dear God, I just thank you for these brothers. I thank you for this church. We're thankful, Father, that we're coming close to being able to carefully and gradually and safely reopen. Help us to do that wisely, Father. Not in a hurriedly fashion, not casting uh, caution to the wind, 
But help us, Father, to move with wisdom and discernment. Dear God, I just pray that you will continue to bless us, lead us and guide us. Bless our worship time today. We pray that your spirit will fill each of us and that you will bring us closer to you. Dear God, in closing, we place all of our sins before you. We confess all of our sins to you. We ask you to forgive us and continue to cover us with the blood of Christ and with your love and with your grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we always pray. Amen. This cornerstone, this solid ground, when through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving seeks, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. This is a portion of our service that we have set aside to gather around the Lord's table and remember the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The scripture this morning will be from 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, beginning in the 23rd verse. And it reads, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. A new covenant of grace and mercy and faith. We are so blessed. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the love that you have for us. 
for the fact that you gave your only son. We want to thank you for that gift. We want to thank you for him, for the perfect life that he lived, that he might be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. We want to thank you for the body that hung on the cross, that carried our sins. We want to thank you for the blood that cleanses us and washes our sins away, the blood of the new covenant that you have established with us through the gift of your son. Father, as we take of this bread, help us to see the body that hung on the cross. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to see the blood that has saved us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. This is a time in our worship where we have, we have the opportunity to give back a portion of what God has blessed us with. The scripture that we're going to read this morning is from 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, beginning in the sixth verse. And it reads, But I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. It's a privilege that we have to give back. It's a blessing to be a part of the Lord's work. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for all that you've given us, for all that you've blessed us with, Father, and we want to be good stewards of that. And Father, we want to give back the way that you have intended us. Father, we want to be cheerful about our giving. We want to be cheerful about our ministries. Father, we want to be the kind of givers that you have made us to be. Father, we ask that you bless our offering this morning, that you would continue to bless every family so that we might bless others. Be with us as we decide how we're going to distribute this money. Give us the wisdom that we need. Bless us in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. There are three ways that you can contribute this morning. The first is to go to our website, holgatecfc.com, hit the Donate tab, and fill in your information there. The second way is you can mail your check to P.O. Box 18226, Seattle, Washington, 98118. The third way is through the Zell app, where you can send your contribution to treasurer at holgatecfc.com. Thank you for your contribution, and may God bless you. Every praise is to our God, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God, glory hallelujah is to our God. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. 
welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. I want to encourage you to invite your friends and your family members to watch our broadcast. These are recorded so you can watch them at any time and of course if you want to watch them again and again you can do that as well. Also immediately after our broadcast today I want to invite you to join us online with your fellow brothers and sisters. We're going to be taking prayer requests and also giving you an opportunity to uh, share words of encouragement. All you need to do is go back to the website, uh, it's holgatecoc.com, and uh, click on the link there and you can join us. Also, uh, today at 12.15, uh, we're going to have another Kids Talk, that's at 12.15, and there's another link for that as well, so hopefully you can join us. If you're interested in becoming a Christian or learning more about our ministry or our church, we invite you to please mail us at contactus at holgatecoc.com. And then finally, uh, we're going to be meeting in person starting on Sunday, July the 5th. We'll be having two services and a Bible class in between. So we'll have a worship assembly at 9 a.m. and that'll last for an hour. And then we'll have a Bible class uh, from 10.15 until 11.15. And then uh, we'll have a second worship service at 11.30 and that'll, that'll last for an hour as well. And we'll be taking temperatures, uh, we'll be wearing masks, social distancing, and everything that we need to do uh, just to keep the, the environment safe. Now we recognize that some of you still even with that opportunity uh, will still want to be watching from home. So we're going to continue our online worship. And uh, so stay tuned again for those details as well. I want to introduce this morning a new series of messages uh, that I want to share over the next several weeks. And, uh, of course, I struggled with, uh, with the title of this message, but here's what I've decided on. I've, I want to talk about bias, discrimination, and the Bible. Bias, discrimination, and the Bible. I want to give us a biblical perspective of current events that are surrounding the issues of race and injustice. And what I want to do is give to us what I call God sight, God sight. God has a way of seeing things and, and God's way of seeing things is different from ours. His way is above our ways. His way of seeing things and observing reality is, is absolutely truthful. So when it comes to understanding everything, we, we need to have God sight. And so what I want us to do is, is to gain that wisdom from God, that insight from God, that growth from God in terms of our perspective, God's sight. Now, Jesus said, you, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, John 8 and verse 32. We need to understand the truth about these things that are being discussed, not just sharing our opinions about things, but there is truth when it comes to these issues that are being explored in our marketplace today. And so this morning, I want to talk about this subject just, just from the standpoint of introduction to talk about bias discrimination in the Bible. And, and we're not going to have time to get into a lot of details today, but I want to begin with a text uh, from uh, the book of James, the New Testament book of James. And I want to begin by reading chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. So James 2, verses 1 through 13. Here the Bible says, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the sight of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? 
Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, then you become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to everyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now James was a leader among the early church. And technically he was the half-brother of Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph. And James writes what we call a, a general epistle, a general letter, as contrasted with the Apostle Paul, when he would write letters, uh, for example, to uh, a church in a specific area in Philippi or Colossae or Ephesians or even Rome. James' letter is a general letter, and so many churches then probably read this letter. And what James does is he, he writes to give practical instructions to Christians on how to live out their faith. James is one of the most practical uh, books of the whole Bible. That's why I love it. And so today there's two key truths that I want to draw out of this text that relate to our subject today. On May 25th of this year, George Floyd, a 46-year-old African-American man, was killed by an officer of the Minneapolis Police Department, Derek Chauvin. Now this case is currently under investigation. The officer has been arrested and the trial will be forthcoming. Now, video of this incident has been shown all over the world. And it set off a firestorm of protests and discussions and political action, all aimed at combating racial discrimination, specifically at the hands of police officers. Now, what I want to do in this series is I want to address some of these issues. Again, from a biblical standpoint, issues of race and racism and bigotry and prejudice and stereotyping and so forth. I want to talk about these things. A number of years ago, I had an opportunity to explore many of these concepts in depth. I served as a diversity instructor for the American Red Cross and also served as a contract trainer for the Boeing Company. I had a good opportunity to listen to people and, and dialogue with them about these subjects and, and really to see how these ideas are reflected in the workplace. And so given what's going on in our society, this now is an opportunity to talk about these subjects. And so we need to talk about these things. The world is talking about them. But we need to talk about them not just from our personal opinions, not just from our feelings or even personal experiences. We need to talk about them from the principles of Scripture with God's sight. Last week, several of us from the church were at CHOP, the Capitol Hill occupation protest zone. Uh, another brother in the area, a minister in the area, Isaac McNally, he and another brother, Andrew, uh, they've been there just about every day. Baron Jones from our congregation has, has helped to coordinate an effort of us having, having a presence there. And that's what we did. We, we showed up there. We wanted to be present. We wanted to, be, to bring Christ into that midst. And we took some time to pray and and have personal conversations and share the gospel with people. Because my observation is that uh, people are needing direction. They're needing truth. They're needing hope. And so we were present there. Uh, we had the opportunity even to preach. We had a PA system and we, we preached. We preached the truth, preached the gospel. Uh, even Jay Ware had an opportunity to uh, present uh, to the crowd there the other day. There's one section called the, the Conversation Cafe. And it, it simply is a just, a, just a, a, a round of chairs and couches, and it's a seating area. There's a little mic there, so anybody can grab the mic and have something to say. I went right in the middle and grabbed the mic, stayed there for about an hour, just speaking truth. 
And so this time is a special opportunity to talk about matters that are affecting our community and our culture. So that's what I want this series to do. I want it to give us a basis for having a discussion. And I want to simply introduce a concept today, specifically two ideas from this text in James chapter 2. Now what James does here is he addresses the issue of discrimination. Discrimination. Now, throughout this series, I'll be uh, giving some definitions of several terms. And I want to define these terms as we talk about them. But how would you define discrimination? Here's one, one possible definition. To discriminate means to make a distinction either in favor of or against a person based on some quality or characteristic or maybe even particularly a group to which they belong. Let me say that again. To discriminate means to make a distinction. Either you're discriminating in favor of someone or against someone because of some quality or characteristic or even their relationship with a particular group. <clears throat> you're saying that this person is different from that person. Therefore, because I see this person as different from that person, I'm going to treat this person differently than I would that person. So discrimination starts with a mindset, an attitude, a way of thinking about someone, but then it translates into behavior. Now, in this instance in James chapter 2, discrimination is not based on race or culture, but rather economics. And when it comes to the idea of discriminating against others in particular, we can treat people differently based on a number of possible factors. For example, we may discriminate against people based on their age. Oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's too young, hadn't had enough experience. That's age. We can do it based on skin color. And, and next week, uh, perhaps we'll talk more about this idea of race. Biologically, there's no such thing as race. I'll give you a little hint about what I'll have to say about that. But skin color, physical appearance, we, we discriminate based on that. We, we tend, even with children, those kids that are more attractive, those kids who, who maybe have a, a certain body type, that, that we tend to uh, look, up them, look upon them with more favor. It's physiological. Maybe based on the neighborhood that someone lives in. I remember when we lived in Detroit, you live, on the, you live on the west side or the east side. People made assumptions about you depending upon where you lived. Your educational level, uh, whom you're related to. If a person holds a political office, you know, which political party are they affiliated with? And let me, let me take this opportunity again because I want to I say this over and over and over again until somebody disagrees with me about this. See, I believe as Christians we need to be servants of reconciliation, ministers of reconciliation. Our, our role in this world is not to contribute to worldly division. And so my observation uh, is that not like none other time since I've been alive, that, that this country is divided politically and it's getting worse. This is an election year. And it, it's going to be, I'm saying as Christians, we should not contribute to that division. Well, how do we do that? Well, I think we can do that by, by not focusing on people or parties. So as soon as you say, well, I'm, I'm for Donald Trump, that, then people say, oh, we don't like you. Or, or I'm for Joe Biden, or oh, I don't like you. Well, that's people. And men are imperfect. We will never agree on people except for one person, that's Jesus Christ. Also, we, we can't, we can't become, come together by party. You're Republican, you're Democrat, and I've said it before, I'm neither Republican nor Democrat. I'm independent. But what we can talk about is policy. We can talk about policy, and, and how is it that we can together address policy issues such as poverty and abortion and immigration and then the, the, the policy issue that we're talking about right now, justice. 
So excuse me for making that little comment. I, I hope you agree with me. If you disagree, let me know. Let's talk about it. So how do we distinguish and, and dis, uh, discriminate? Another way is, is if a person is a celebrity. Now, during one of our worship services, if, if, if Russell Wilson, quarterback of the Seahawks, would walk in, that would change the whole dynamic of our whole assembly. Celebrity. We, we, we treat people differently because they're celebrities. Uh, how about how long they've been in the church? You know, when a new person comes, they're baptized, they make a commitment to the church, and they speak up, they have an opinion about, oh, well, he hadn't, he hadn't been here long enough. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She hasn't had any experience. We discriminate against that. How much money they give. We distinguish people by that and discriminate. Well, in James, this is what it was. It was all about wealth. And so he illustrates it. He says, suppose a man comes into your meeting, your assembly, your gathering, and, and he's wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and probably the ring was not just one ring. He's probably got multiple rings on all of his fingers. He says that person comes in, and then at the same time, a poor man comes in. You know, maybe he's homeless. You know, he smells like urine. He's been on the street. He's wearing rags, and he comes in. And then you show special attention to the man in the, in the fine clothes. You say, look, here, here, here's a good seat for you. You know, come right here. Here's a special seat, you know, just for you. You're special. Sit here. But then you say to the poor man, first, we don't, we don't even offer him a seat. We say, no, you go stand over there. You smell, you don't look good. We're, you know, you're embarrassing. Get over there, just stand in the doorway so we can make sure the air is coming through so we get some fresh air. Otherwise, we say... Just, well, just, if you need to sit down, just, just sit down there at my feet. See, I'm guilty of this. Uh, I've met some rich people who live in... I, I, I've met a couple of folks who are probably some of the wealthiest people in the Seattle area. And, and even though uh, the coronavirus is around, I will shake their hand. Why is that? Subconsciously, I may be thinking, well, if I... If I treat this person in a favorable way, maybe he or she will be favorable to me and maybe in turn some of that wealth will rub off. Well, James condemns that kind of thinking. James condemns that kind of behavior. He says, have you not discriminated against yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? It's verse 4. James says, you've made these worldly distinctions and you've looked down upon certain people in your assembly because of their lack of wealth. That's why he says among yourselves. That's why we're, we're thinking these, all these folks are Christians. He says what you've done is you've created division among the church. And God hates division. You've elevated some and you've lowered others. When in Christ all of us are one. He says, you become judges with evil thoughts. You, you've judged the value and the worth of a man. You've done that by what he has, what he owns. See, money is no indicator of the worth of a man. And see, just like today, uh, people who have money, they can afford to pay uh, for legal representation. Attorneys are expensive. And so just as in our time that, that if you have a legal issue and if you have money, uh, uh, you can hire an attorney who knows more about the law. You can, you can hire a whole bunch of attorneys and you're more likely to get off. So in the days of James, the rich had political power. They had judicial power. They could drag a person into court and receive a favorable judgment. Well, James condemns discrimination. And then he defends the poor. Watch what happens starting at verse 5. Let me read verse, verse 5 and following. Again, James 2. Verse 5. Let me read that again. He says, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those of the world or those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom that he promised to those he loved him? 
In other words, James is saying the person that you have rejected, that poor person against whom you're discriminated with, God has chosen that person. You see him as being poor in the eyes of the world, but yet he's rich in the eyes of God. He's rich in faith and he has the greatest inheritance that a person can have. That's the inheritance of the kingdom. He says, but you've exploited the poor. He says, is it not the rich are the ones who are exploiting you? Is it not the rich who are dragging you into court? Is it not the rich that's slandering the very name of him to whom you belong? See, by discriminating against the poor, James says, you, you fail to see someone who has value. And someone who is truly rich, not because of what they own materially, but because they're rich in faith. He says, you've insulted them. So he defends the poor. He points out the fallacy of favoring the rich. And so James, James says very simply, he says, don't, don't discriminate against others. Don't favor the rich and shun the poor. Uh, that's the first point that he makes. He says, don't discriminate. And secondly, he says, rather, love everyone. Don't discriminate against anyone, rather, love everyone. Let's look at verses 8 through 11. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery but commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. See, it could be that people in the church, after they had shown favoritism to this rich person, they may have justified their actions by saying, well, we're only showing love to our rich brothers. The, the, the law says love our neighbor as ourselves. We're just showing love to this person. And this quote comes from the Old Testament, from Leviticus 19 and verse 18. It says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now the Jews had interpreted that this destruction only, this instruction only applied to a fellow Jew. And Jesus, in Luke chapter 10, tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, and he does away with that misconception. So James says showing favoritism is a sin. And the flip side of that, if you discriminate against an individual for any reason and in any way, that is sin. You become a lawbreaker just as if you had committed adultery, just as if you had committed murder. So he says don't show favoritism. Don't be partial. Don't be a respecter of person. Rather, love everybody. Now, here's two applications. One, in terms of the case of, of uh, George Floyd. The officer, Derek Chauvin, when it comes to the actions of law enforcement officers, here's the message to them. The message is, as you are enforcing the law, you treat everyone equally. And I think that's what the community is saying. That's a biblical principle. Treat everyone equally. And that's the, the phrase, equal justice under the law. That's what that means. Don't discriminate and, and, and treat this person one way because of who he is or she is. And then you turn around and treat somebody else another way in terms of applying the, the law or, or your training or your behavior or how you arrest somebody. You treat everybody equally. That's a biblical principle. Here's a question. Let me, let me have you think about this. The question here is, we talk about skin color. What if George Floyd 
would have been white. What if he had been white? Would he still be alive today? That's something I want you to ponder. And then here's the message for us from this text. The message for us is we are to treat all people equally. We're not to be partial. Especially when it comes to other members of the body of Christ. We are to love everyone equally. See, here's the key. When we do this, when we treat everyone equally, not discriminate for some and against others, when we do that, we are showing that we are truly God's children. Because we look like Him in our character. Children look like their fathers. When we are acting impartially towards others, we're showing and displaying and reflecting the character of God. God Himself is no respecter of persons. When Peter addressed the family in the household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, and we'll probably look at that text at some point in this series. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, Peter's addressing uh, 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 this crowd, and he says, I now realize that it is true that God does not show favoritism. God is not partial. God is not a respecter of person, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and who does what is right. So when we show this quality, we, we, we are showing and reflecting the quality of God. God does not discriminate. In the eyes of God, every person is valuable. No individual is any more valuable than the other. And remember, Jesus loved and died for everyone. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word and for its truth and for how relevant it is, especially in these times. We pray, first of all, as your children, that we might destroy our attitudes and behaviors of favoritism and partiality. And as we do that, we know that we'll reflect your qualities and your character and give you that glory and help us to demonstrate that to our community and our society and our world and help us to preach that message. Through the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you immediately after this broadcast to join us live online. We'll be live online and we'll be sharing your prayer request and praying for you individually. And also we'll be taking some time to give you an opportunity uh, to share words of encouragement with your brothers and sisters. And then, of course, at 1215, we'll be having our kids talk. And both links are on our website, holgatecoc.com. Again, if you're interested in becoming a Christian or learning more about our ministries or our church or becoming a Christian, contact us at the email, contact us at holgatecoc.com. And then finally, uh, we will be uh, starting our live worship assemblies uh, at the church at 2600 South Holgate Street in Seattle, starting on Sunday, February the 5th. And we'll have uh, two services, one at 9 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. And then we'll have a Bible class in between at 10.15. So uh, if you're interested in joining us for either of those services, we invite you to do that. We'll also, in the meantime, still continue our online services. And typically on the first Sundays of the month, we have been hosting our congregational updates. Uh, because of the holiday, we will postpone that. We'll give you an update on uh, when we'll have that later. So I hope you can join us. Saints of God, come on, put those hands together. Let's praise Him today. Let's praise Him. Yes, it's just something about Sunday morning. Well, said I can't on, wait. I can't oh, wait to Sunday yeah. morning. Sunday morning. To sing and shout. Sing and shout. And praise the Lord. Praise well, the Lord. Well, ain't good to lie. To Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Hey, we're together, yeah. together. Together. Church together. in one accord. Praise it. It's something about.